Hi, good Louisiana. afternoon, everybody. Yes, thanks for being with us. Um, I'm going to try very, very hard to make this interesting. It's hard to be interested in vein anatomy. It's hard. But then the very first time you have a patient in your office that's asking you for help with their varicose veins or their ulcer, all of a sudden you wish you paid attention to this a little bit more. So and it's Clyde, all, there's also vascular surgeons who do only veins. So it's a big part of the true, practice. True, it's it is. Practice. So, and it's all about the anatomy, really. It all boils down to that. The, one of the tenets I should mention right from the beginning is that if there's a varicosity, it comes from somewhere. You don't just get a random varicose vein. So you, it, you can always trace it back with your knowledge of the anatomy. You can always figure out where it's coming from. And depending on whether or not it's indicated, you may or may not treat it. But at least you can understand where it's coming from. So, you know, you've all heard about the various stages of vein disease. They start with something as simple as these telangiectasias. Um, getting progressing to something as bad as a venous ulcer. It's estimated that 1% of people will get a venous ulcer in their lifetime, which is actually a number that sounds fairly high to me, but 1%, that's not insignificant. Um, now, this is one of the signs, you know, when you see your patient in the office, a number of signs that you look for that can tip you off to venous insufficiency because sometimes they're not as clear as venous edema, heaviness, aching in the legs. And so you may see something that's called corona phlebotatica. It's this classic cluster of spider veins in the, at the medial malleolus. You see that, and it's the effect of the hydrostatic pressure from standing and gravity and incompetent valves. It doesn't necessarily point to deep venous insufficiency or superficial venous insufficiency, but it's a marker of venous insufficiency. So, you know, this is an example of somebody who's got the classic changes of very severe venous disease. You have the dermatitis or the eczema that's associated with venous disease. You have the active ulceration. You have something called lipoderma lipodermatosclerosis, which is the brawny pigmentation changes that are apparent in these patients from hemocytorin being deposited in the tissues from years of this uh, elevated venous pressure. So the anatomy boils down to three systems, really. You have your deep venous system, your superficial venous system, and your perforator veins, right? So the superficial venous system connects to your deep venous system in two places in the legs, the popliteal vein and the femoral vein. So at those two places, you have a connection between your superficial venous system and your deep. There's also another system in there, the perforators. They also connect between the superficial and the deep. Now, those are variably located. They tend to be located in certain regions that I'll talk about, but it's important to keep that in mind. So it's always about the superficial venous system, the deep venous system, and keeping in mind where your insufficiency is coming from. So the anatomy of the, femoral, of the deep venous system, it starts down in the, in the foot and the calf, right? So you have these venous sinusoids in the soleus muscle. It's a very important um, area. And so that's a deep, you know, the soleal veins are deep veins. That's another thing that comes up sometimes. Is this a deep venous thrombosis if it's in the soleal veins? Yes. <clears throat> Granted, it's below the knee, but and, and may be treated differently than other DVTs, but it is in the soleal veins, you have deep venous uh, va uh, sinusoids. You have your tibial veins. They go towards the popliteal vein, the femoral vein, and the deep femoral vein. They all make up and so in the past, just to alleviate any confusion, we do not use the term superficial femoral vein anymore. That's called the femoral vein. It was a ridiculous term. I don't know why anybody ever called it that because medical doctors were treating these patients uh, wrong because they thought it was a superficial vein. So they weren't necessarily treating them for the DVT that they had. So the femoral vein is called the femoral vein. It's not the superficial vein anymore. And then you have your common femoral vein. So your superficial and your deep connect to form the common femoral vein. Um, there's also, I should mention about that deep venous system, there's a system of valves, obviously, in the femoral vein. They increase in number as you go down towards the foot. So you have more valves the further down the leg you go. The superficial venous system, again, it starts with the, when you're looking at the great saphitus and the small saphitus. Those are the two primary axial veins of the superficial venous system. So at the medial aspect of the leg, you have your great saphitus vein. It starts just anterior to the... Um, <coughs> Uh, it just starts just anterior to the uh, medial malleolus at the uh, foot, P crosses up the leg. At the level of the tibia, it crosses posterior and ascends up to be anterior medial to the knee, and then goes up the thigh medially and joins at the saphenofemoral junction to the femoral vein. The presence of a valve at the saphenofemoral junction is one of the most cons constant and consistent anatomic things that are present in the venous system. Everything else is very, very variable, but the saphenofemoral valve is present in almost 100% of patients, so that's something to note. And so again, like the deep venous system, you have valves in the superficial venous system that could become incompetent and lead to varicosities, and they increase in number as you get down to the foot. So small saphenous vein. Small saphenous vein starts lateral 
at the lateral malleolus posterior to it, extends up the posterior aspect of the calf. For the first two-thirds of that calf, it runs with the sural nerve. And then as, you, as it goes deep to penetrate the fascia, it separates from the sural nerve. It's no longer next to it. That's significant for treatment. When you're treating a small saphenous vein, you have to be worried about whether or not you might injure the sural nerve. So as long as you're staying, usually we, we treat the, the third, the top third of the small saphenous vein. I'm, I'm saying top. I don't want to be confusing with proximal, distal, the, the top part of the, of the calf. That third of the small saphenous vein, that's the part that we usually treat safely because it's no longer next to that sural nerve. And so less in incidence of injury. And now the small saphenous vein is, extends up to join the popliteal vein, usually most of the time within eight centimeters of the knee. So it can join it uh, below. It's usually above the knee joint, but it can, it can, it's very, very variable. But most of the time it's within eight centimeters of that knee joint. So. When you look at a patient and you look at their ultrasound, because when you're treating their veins, you always will look at the ultrasound. You see this, this classic finding of this Egyptian eye, it's called. And it's, um, it's this, low, this, this great saphenous vein here. You see it on cross-section on duplex. And it's within the saphenous sheath anteriorly and the muscular fascia posteriorly. And it forms this sheath. And, it, and it's a classic finding. It helps you to find the great saphenous vein. Um, there are very many, many anatomic variations to this, but this is something to keep in mind. The, um, this is a little diagram showing you some of the variations. Some people, a certain percent of patients will have a double saphenous vein. It could be in the thigh only, it could be in the calf only. Um, and every variation is possible, and I've seen every one of them. I mean, you can have your classic one, which is this, I gotta get this pointed. Okay. So the classic finding is you have your saphenous vein within the sheath, and you see this eye. You can have this duplicate, uh, this, uh, saphenous vein like this where you have two in a sheath. You can have one where you have an accessory saphenous vein, so it runs anterior to it. It's no longer in the sheath. And it's important to identify the anatomy, know what you're dealing with, whether or not this is just a tributary or whether or not this runs along the entire length of the saphenous vein. This is the H vein configuration. It's not really that significant what it's called. It's just, just note that you can have a sheath um, around each one of these, like this, this anterior saphenous accessory also contained within a sheath. And then you can have it not in the sheath at all. It's thought that patients whose saphenous veins are not contained within the sheath or the portion that is not contained within the sheath may be at higher risk for forming a varicosity. It would make sense since it seems to have less support, but that's not really uh, firmly defined. And so, again, um, what, what's significant about this? Well, again, these are the veins. I listed these because I think these are the ones that I've come across. There's a million tributaries that are named it seems, but what do you need to know? You, these are the ones you end up dealing with. And although it looks like a lengthy list, they, they really, it's not that much. Really, you have your anterior thigh circumflex vein or this anterior accessory of the GSV in the thigh. That could lead to varicosities. That's a, that's a common vein. You're, you're probably going to end up dealing with that quite a bit. And then you have things like this posterior accessory GSV in the leg, posterior accessory in the thigh posterior thigh circumflex vein. I'll talk a little bit about these and try to make it relevant because it's very dry when you just look at a term like this. Uh, the, all right, so here's this anterior circumflex vein. So you have a patient who comes into your office and they have these varicosities that are located on their anterior thigh, see here, and then it usually extends down laterally. Uh, and this is usually because of incompetence of this anterior circumflex vein or anterior accessory of the, of the GSV. And so when you you're able to identify that, you can treat that source of reflux, you can remove it, you, at least understanding where this comes from. Sometimes it's not as easy as that. Sometimes there are multiple sources of reflux, and it may just be that on one side you have this anterior accessory that's incompetent, and on the other side you have a perforator that's incompetent. There's, often there's two or multiple pathways for an incompetent vein. That's where it gets interesting, challenging to try to figure it out. Anybody can just treat a, a little varicosity, laser, a great saphenous vein in the thigh, but when it gets complicated, it's, that's where it actually gets interesting. So this is a CT venogram, not that this is a test that you would routinely get, but these, these were images I thought were cool. They were from a study, so I thought they were worth looking at. And so you can see here a demonstration of this, a nice picture of, of this anterior uh, thigh branch of the saphenous vein as it runs here laterally and where it just originates from that. So I thought that was cool. So the superficial uh, venous system, again, you have your saphenopopliteal junction. Your s small saphenous vein usually joins above the popliteal fossa. The, all right, so the small saphenous, also many variations to it, just like any other vein. 
the more important one that I've come across, that I hadn't come across in medical school or residency or fellowship even, is this Giacomini vein. So the sa small saphenous usually joins the popliteal vein. It doesn't always. Sometimes it goes right up and joins at other locations, but usually does go into the popliteal vein. Sometimes it extends cranially, and the cranial extension of that small saphenous vein is called the vein of Giacomini. And that vein itself becomes significant because it can become incompetent. So you see here this diagram. You see the small saphenous vein joining at the popliteal vein, but then it, it continues to extend up here, wraps around to the GSV, to the great saphenous vein, through this vein of Giacomini and this posterior medial thigh vein. So that's the other reason why that's interesting somewhat is that it's where the small saphenous and the great saphenous join each other. So I talk about the, small, the superficial and the deep joining each other. Well, this is where the saphenuses join each other. So the saphenuses can join each other through the Giacomini vein and sometimes through other tributary veins, but also relevant because when you're treating it, it's not always one place you're gonna treat it. You may need to treat it in both directions. So <clears throat> small saphenous vein, this is a picture of a patient who has a varicosity because of small saphenous vein reflux. As you would expect, you see it located posteriorly in the thigh. Um, Another picture of that, I think, I'm gonna skip that just for the, this is an interesting one. Again, this is cool. This is your great saphenous vein running here. This is your small saphenous. This is an intersaphenous, another connection between the two saphenuses. And so you can have these intersaphenous branches between the two and trying to figure out which one to ablate is a question. You don't know which one is actually causing this varicosity, but understanding the anatomy at least allows you to make a, an educated decision. Um, Again, very variable. Not everybody has this Giacomini vein. You, quite often, what you find is this, this scenario where the muscular sinusoids of the thigh just drain this, in this direction down into and join the small saphenous, right? So this is, again, this is that Giacomini vein. It's the cranial extension of the small saphenous vein. And <clears throat> another diagram. So this would be a patient with Giacomini vein reflux. This is the varicosities that they have located in the back of their, in the, usually in the back of the thigh. And depending on where, what else is the problem, you'll have other varicosities. So, and you can always try to figure out a roadmap and what's the cause of this. Again, it wraps around, that Giacomini wraps around to join the great saphenous medially, anterior medially. And so here, here again, you have these varicosities. This is from that, all from that Giacomini vein that's incompetent. Um, reticular veins are what you see, you know, you see spider veins, a lot of patients come in, they want to be treated for cosmetics, the telangiectetic veins, and it's, it's worth mentioning that the reticular veins are the veins that are just slightly larger in size, they're about two to three millimeters in diameter, those lie and they drain the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So you can't treat these spider veins without treating the reticular veins. That's another thing that we have to always keep in mind. You're not, it's not going to work if you have this incompetent reticular vein. So. I think a couple of things worth mentioning. The direction of the valves, um, you know, you have your superficial venous system, you have your perforating veins and the deep veins, and the direction of blood flow is from the superficial vein through the perforated veins into the deep veins. And you can have incompetence here where the blood flow will back up into your superficial vein. Um, perforators. Uh, this is what an ultra ultrasound of a perforator vein looks like. So you see here, this is the deep vein. These are your superficial veins. This is your perforator vein. This is your connecting. This actually whole thing. This is your deep vein, I apologize. This is your perforator vein, this whole lengthy thing. And so this is something that, uh, if this is the source of the incompetence, another nice picture there you can see of your perforator vein. If you're able to identify that as your source, that might be what you need to treat. Um, really, do these, these are the old uh, nomenclature for all the clusters of perforator veins, but basically you can have them in the thigh, you can have them in the calf. And the one thing that's, one last thing I'm gonna mention is this uh, posterior uh, tibial perforators come off the posterior accessory GSV. So sometimes you try to, you, you can't get to your perforator veins. You don't know how to get to them. And it's important to note that there is this posterior accessory great saphenous vein that usually that's where your incompetent perforators are coming off of. I think Voila. that's a good place to stop. Yeah. Everything you wanted to know about the lower extremity